go live. <laughs> this is so, a first. Mandy, um, <laughs> uh, I think most of you guys yeah. have probably already met Mandy, but just quickly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what do you do? Yeah, so, so I'm a nurse and a midwife, work in a general practice up in the northern suburbs. Um, yeah, so do that full time and it's great. So lots of very wide and varied people come through my office every day and have very interesting conversations with people at times and it's yeah it's great and tell Mm. us what's your passion my passion is women's ministry so particularly teaching women to read and understand the bible well um that's you know and to be able to apply it to their lives that's that's where my passion lies in women's ministry is good good bible teaching um and good reading and understanding of the word um and and i guess getting those principles out and how can we practically be living out yeah, um, these teachings, yeah. And how do you mm. see your passion interacting with your everyday life? My passion interacting with everyday life? That's a curly one. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, think, I think it's just example in Christ mm. in my work um, or even at church just in conversations with other young women. Um, being being available, being willing to be used, um, yeah, and just I guess looking for those those particular moments that God might might be placing in front of you for a gospel focused conversation or or um, a God God ordained moment. I think yeah, mm-hmm. that's probably, probably one last where it question. Is. Yes. What do you like to do with your leisure time? With my leisure time, <laughs> um, I I enjoy a good pot of tea. I, I quite like Netflix. Um, <laughs> what else? My doona is also very comfy as well. <laughs> um, no, I love to go on nice walks. I love being in nature. Nature kind of centres me. Um, so, yeah, either at the beach or bushwalks or stuff, catching up with friends, a good, good coffee, good, good conversation, meaningful conversation. So, yeah, that's, well, that's probably me. Yeah, you. thank and, you. Um, we'll look forward cool, to thank you. Awesome. Cool. Well, good morning. It's so nice to be welcomed back. Um, I was I was very thrilled to be invited back in again to come and share with you. And good morning to all of you who are watching online, wherever you are. Um, thank you for for joining in um, with us today. So we're looking um, at Acts chapter ten to chapter eleven, verse eighteen. That's our passage um, for today. On the theme of the breaking down of barriers, so that's kind of where, where we're going to be heading um, today. But just, just to start, I see, like, have you ever had your plans change? Maybe it's been for a gathering with the girls, maybe it's been that quiet afternoon you're hoping to have after church, maybe it's that one event you were looking forward to going to with just you and that friend, um, but something changes and suddenly it's not just about you and that friend anymore. Um, suddenly someone else joins you in coming to the event or that quiet afternoon you were wanting to have by yourself suddenly becomes the exact opposite. You find yourself unexpectedly spending it with people all afternoon and for introverts that can be really, really difficult at times. Or your gathering with the girls suddenly becomes a gathering with a girl and someone you don't know very well either. How do you react Do you get frustrated? Do you get upset? Do you maybe pout a little bit? Um, Or do you take it in your stride? Do you roll with the change and just just see what happens? Um, Do you see these changes as a good thing? Could they even possibly be a God thing? And we know in life that plans change all the time. (laughs) And the early church was no different. And so far, um, in the preceding chapters to where we are today, the message had just been for the Jews, um, but the plans were changing. Now the church was being built up in Judea and Galilee and Samaria, um, and those who at one time would never have had the privilege of hearing the message of Jesus Christ were now receiving it. And then, so then when we reach Acts chapter 10, where we are today, the plans really begin to change. Um, So turn with me to Acts chapter 10. We're going to read the whole passage. Um, So just roll with me right through until 11 verse 18. This is such a good narrative. Um, Yeah, and I just, I didn't feel that we could, that we could leave it without reading the entire thing. So um, I'll be reading from ESV version as well, so... 
All right. Chapter, Acts chapter 10, verse 1. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion of what was known as the Italian cohort, a devout man who feared God with all his household, gave alms generously to the people and prayed continually to God. About the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God come in and say to him, Cornelius. And he stared at him in terror and said, what is it, Lord? And he said to him, your prayers and your arms have ascended as a memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa and bring one Simon, who is called Peter. He is lodging with one Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the sea. When the angel who spoke to him had departed, he called two of his servants and a devout soldier from among those who attended him. And having related everything to them, he sent them to Joppa. The next day, as they were on the journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the housetop about the sixth hour to pray. And he became hungry and wanted something to eat. But while they were preparing it, he fell into a trance and saw the heavens opened and something like a great sheet descending, being let down by its four corners upon the earth. In it were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air. And there came a voice to him, rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, by no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice came to him again a second time, what God has made clean, do not call common. This happened three times, and the thing was taken up at once to heaven. Now, while Peter was inwardly perplexed about as to what the vision he had seen might mean, behold, the men who were sent by Cornelius, having made inquiry for Simon's house, stood at the gate and called out to ask whether Simon, who was called Peter, was lodging there. And while Peter was pondering the vision, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are looking for you. Rise and go down and accompany them without hesitation, for I have sent them. And Peter went down to the men and said, I am the one who you are looking for. What is the reason for your coming? And they said, Cornelius, a centurion, an upright and God-fearing man, who is well spoken of by the whole Jewish nation, was directed by a holy angel to send for you to come to his house and to hear what you have to say. So he invited them in to be his guests. The next day he rose and went away with them, and some of the brothers from Joppa accompanied him. And on the following day they entered Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. When Peter entered, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter lifted him up, saying, Stand up, I too am a man. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many persons gathered. And he said to them, You yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with or to visit anyone of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. So when, when I was sent for, I came without objection. I asked then, why you sent for me? And Cornelius said, four days ago, about this hour, I was praying in my house at the ninth hour, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing and said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard and your arms have been remembered before God. Send therefore to Joppa and ask for Simon, who is called Peter. He is lodging in the house of Simon, a tanner by the sea. So I sent for you at once and you have been kind enough to come. Now therefore we are all here in the presence of God to hear all that you have commanded by the Lord. So Peter opened his mouth and said, Truly I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. As for the word that he sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. You yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee after the baptism that John proclaimed, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all that he did, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him on the third day and made him appear, not to all the people, but to us who had been chosen by God as witnesses, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. Uh, sorry, I've just lost my place. There we go. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be judge of the living and the dead. 
To him, all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. While Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. And the believers from among the circumcised who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles. For they were hearing them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter declared, Can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked him to remain for some days. Now the apostles and the brothers who were throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcision party criticized him, saying, You went to uncircumcised men and ate with them. But Peter began and explained it to them in order. I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision, something like a great sheet descending, being let down from heaven by its four corners. And it came down to me. Looking at it closely, I observed animals and beasts of prey and reptiles and birds of the air. And I heard a voice saying to me, rise, Peter, kill and eat. But I said, by no means, Lord, for nothing common or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But the voice answered a second time from heaven, what God has made clean, do not call common. This happened three times and all was drawn up again into heaven. And behold, at that very moment, three men arrived at the house in which we were, sent to me from Caesarea. And the spirit told me to go with them, making no distinction. These six brothers also accompanied me, and we entered the man's house. And he told us how he had seen the angels stand in his house and say, Send to Joppa and bring Simon, who is called Peter. He will declare to you a message by which you will be saved, you and your household. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them just as on us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave the same gift to them as he gave to us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could stand in God's way? When they heard these things, they fell silent and they glorified God, saying, Then to the Gentiles also God has granted repentance that leads to life amazing story I love it and in this story in Acts we're introduced for the first time to a man named Cornelius he's like no one we've been introduced to before he's a centurion he's a leader of a large group of Roman soldiers known as the Italian cohort but there's something different about this man he's a devout man One who fears God, gives alms generously to the people, and he prays continually to God. He's a God-fearer, participating in all the Jewish religious practices of the day. But then in verse 3, we see something very different happen. We see the plans change. Cornelius receives a vision, or a visitation from God. And if we didn't know that this was Cornelius, if we took out verses 1 and 2 and just started at 3, we would think that this was a Jew that was being visited um, by God. But God comes down and meets with Cornelius, a Gentile. His faith, his sincere, devoted heart is recognised and acknowledged and acted on. The ninth hour of the day, which is 3pm in the afternoon, it's the traditional Jewish afternoon of prayer and sacrifice. Um, so even in that, you can see that Cornelius is, is really practising these Jewish um, traditions, I suppose. God affirms that his prayers have been heard and outlines how they are to be answered. And Cornelius immediately obeys. So he's sending, he sends the servants, sends from his household and a devout soldier to go with them and find that one, who is Simon, who is called Peter. So then as they journey, we then see Peter, whom these men have been sent to find, and he is also found to be praying. It's lunchtime. Naturally, he becomes hungry. And as they are preparing the food for him to eat, we read that he falls then into a trance and a vision and comes before him too. Only in this vision, though, something radical is about to take place. Plans are about to change. 
So in Peter's vision, we see the heavens open and a sheet come down filled with all the animals of the earth. I reckon that would have been a little bit scary um, (laughs) to see that coming down. But Peter is told to get up and slaughter these animals and eat. You're hungry, Peter. Here, have these foods that I've prepared for you. But what's Peter's response? Does he jump right in there with his butcher's knife and, awesome, let's go kill all these food? Absolutely not, Lord. I have never touched these common unclean foods in my life. But God's patient with Peter. Peter, what I have made clean, do not call common. Three times God tells this to Peter. And Peter has a history with three times, doesn't he? Uh, So three times he denies Christ. Three times he's restored again by Christ after his resurrection. And now three times God is telling him what I have called, do not call common and unclean, um, that which I now call clean. So the plans are continuing to change. And naturally, Peter would have been perplexed that what on earth could God mean by this vision? This massive sheet coming down with all these foods on it for thousands of generations, this is the way it's always been. I've always eaten these other foods, not these foods that were on the sheet. I've never done anything to make me unclean as a Jew. Is it possible that God could be changing things now? (laughs) That would be ridiculous. But at that very precise moment, as Peter was pondering these exact thoughts, Cornelius' men are arriving at the gate. Can you imagine what's going through Peter's mind as these men arrive and ask for him? I, I wonder if just for a brief moment, Peter thought, could God mean this, man? Like there's three men that have come and... Nah, but that would be ridiculous. But then the spirit says, yep. That's exactly what I want you to do. Peter, I have sent these men to you and I want you to accompany them without hesitation. Without hesitation. Without a second thought, I want you to go with them. For the Jew, their whole interaction with Gentiles was built around hesitation. Hesitation that if they shared a meal together... They may eat foods that aren't appropriate. Hesitation that if they went with them, they would need to purify themselves afterwards. Hesitation that simply being with them would make them unclean. Yet here God was saying, go with them without hesitation, for I have sent them to you. The plans are changing, and they're changing quite radically. But Peter goes, Obedient to what I'm sure he felt was completely illogical. Like to him, that would have been illogical for God to say, go with these men without hesitation. So he goes and he says, I am who you're looking for. How can I help you? And the men recount the experience of their master Cornelius, their God-fearing master, who was respected among all the Jewish peoples. Did you notice that when they said that? That he's respected. So his his. His name is going out among the Jewish peoples, had also been visited by an angel and asked for him to come and share the message of Jesus Christ. And so he invites them to stay. The plans are changing very quickly here. It is one thing to have someone stay in your home, but then it's entirely different to go and travel with them, isn't it? Um, But that's what Peter did. Beginning to understand that something very radical was going to take place with this centurion from Caesarea. He brings some of the brothers with him and together they accompany the men overnight back to Cornelius. So four days. So this, I love this, that this is like a four day thing that's unfolding. So four days had passed since Cornelius had sent his men to find this one called Peter. Um, But he was expectant that he would return. Cornelius was there waiting and so expectant that he'd brought in his relatives and his close friends to also be in the house, knowing that on this day, Peter is going to come. And when he does arrive, um, the awe at seeing this man who had spent time with Jesus was one of his close friends. I think it just overtakes him. And it says that he worships him, but Peter says, stand up for I'm just like you. 
I am only a man and there is only one who's worthy of receiving worship like that. And as Peter looks around the room, as he walks through the house, I imagine, going from room to room, meeting all these people who to, are here to hear the message that he has, he gets it. He now understands exactly what God has meant in that vision. From now on, there is no distinction between you and me. God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. Four days ago, guys, I would never have done this. But now things are changing and I've come without hesitation and without objection. Please tell me what it is you want to say. The plans have changed. The barrier that existed between Jew and Gentile, between clean and unclean, is now no more. The barriers are being broken down. So then you get this amazing recount. Cornelius recounts a vision that he has, the visitation with the angel. So he explains that, he explains the message and details how he was to find Peter and explains that he's ready and willing and he's waiting, waiting to hear. And Peter now sees that this barrier is once and for all broken. Verse 34, and I think this is the key verse to this whole narrative. Truly, I understand that God shows no partiality But in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. Yeah. The point of Peter's vision, I think, is now completely understood in that statement, in that verse. No longer is being a Jew what makes you special before God. No longer is doing sacrifices or being circumcised what makes you acceptable for God. Now, anyone from any nation who fears God, who loves him with their whole heart, is acceptable to him. The barriers are broken down, and from now on, there is now no partiality. So Peter follows through on this newfound conviction and shares with them the gospel-saving message of Jesus Christ. And you see there, from uh, 36 onwards, just that step-by-step, he's recounting the man and the message of Christ. He recounts the tragedy of his crucifixion, but the glory and the miracle of his resurrection and invites them to receive forgiveness of sins. And in that moment, the barriers are broken down forever and the Holy Spirit falls on all who heard the word. As at the time of Pentecost, so now the Spirit is also freely, graciously and lavishly given on these Gentiles. The gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out on even the Gentiles. There's a second Pentecost that's happened right now. The tongue utterances, the worship that was evident at Pentecost is also evident among these people. God has cemented his word that nothing is common or unclean and no partiality will exist from now on. Gentiles, you are welcome as much as any Jew. And the blessing poured out on them that I poured out on Pentecost, I'm also going to pour out on you. The death and the resurrection of my son has changed everything forever. The barriers are forever broken down. How does Peter respond? He's fully convinced of God's word, isn't he? He's fully convinced and that these radical changes have occurred. And he said, these people are just like us. They've received the blessing of the Holy Spirit, that falling down of the Holy Spirit on them, just like we have. So how can we withhold baptism from them? So they are. And fully embracing these new brothers and sisters in the Lord, he stays with them a number of days. And I'm sure that time was discipling them in their faith, fulfilling that mandate that Robert brought to us last night of discipleship um, with that. Peter's obedience at the face of everything that seemed illogical to him led to the first Gentile convert of Christianity. And we know the rest of the story because we're sitting here today as a result of this story. But it doesn't end there, does it? The story does go on into chapter 11. And so Peter and the men who had accompanied him had this remarkable encounter, fully convinced of the new way God was working. Word had spread that this event occurred. We read that in verse 1 of chapter 11, that that the word had spread throughout all Judea uh, there, and that it appeared that most were accepting of it. 
and were actually embracing the new way that God was working. But not everyone, particularly the devout Jews in Jerusalem. Um, So the men of the circumcision party uh, were there and naturally they're criticising him for these interactions. So these are like, these are the devout of the devout amongst the Jews um, with that. But Peter, so I think Peter preempts that there's, he's going to get some flack here, so I need to go up to Jerusalem and meet with these men and explain what's happened. And so he does. He recounts his vision in detail, uh, the vision that he had, the arrival of Cornelius' men at the exact moment. I love how he crafts it in such a way that you cannot ignore that God is over this whole encounter that this happened and then this happened and then this happened and this happened and this happened. Um, If God then gave the same gift to them as he gave to us when we believed in the Lord, who was I that I could stand in in God's way? That statement summarizes this whole encounter as being completely led by God. And what's the the Jews' response, the men of the circumcision party's response to this when they hear it? What did they do? They fall silent, don't they? Yeah. But yet they glorify God as well. I think they could see that God was amongst this, that this is of God. This has been completely ordained by him. And yes, the plans are changing. And this mandate that we have to go into the world and to all nations is actually true. And God really does want this to happen. And so they fall down and worship God as well, saying, and to the Gentiles also God has granted repentance that leads to life. I think there was a process. Yeah. Yeah, I don't, I don't know that that would have happened instantly, but, um, but yeah, they certainly do recognise that this is from God. Yeah, for sure. So they too now get it. They too now see that the barriers are broken down and the forgiveness of sins is open to all. Jesus' death and resurrection is for all mankind in every nation. The barriers are broken down. So God did something radical that day in Caesarea and in that household that God demonstrates that no longer would there be distinction between his people and that the breaking down of barriers is what enables the gospel to be shared. Uh, so, so breaking down the barrier of distinction uh, that we see there, that there's now to be no distinction, enables the gospel to go out. And we see this example through three main characters. So you see that with Peter and with Cornelius and with these men in the circumcision party. For, we, for Peter, we see that he was no longer to regard himself above those that are common or unclean. Uh, food laws were what it was that made the Jews distinct from the Gentiles and made their table fellowship awkward. Peter himself even declares how unlawful it is for him to be at their house. He recognises that. Like, I shouldn't be here, guys, but I am because the Spirit has led me here to be here. But God was breaking down that barrier. For Cornelius, we see how this distinction was no longer going to be relevant. No longer was being circumcised the only way that you were made acceptable to be a part of God's family. Um, one comment, commentary that I read said that Cornelius was everything but a proselyte. So to, to, to go the next step would mean circumcision for him. So he was, he was at that point to then be circumcised and he wasn't um, with that. Uh, so no longer were sacrifices required for the forgiveness of sins. Prayers, acts of charity and a heart that truly feared God were now the sacrifices that were deemed sufficient. Um, The barrier that prevented people from truly entering into worship with God was broken, Um, that it no longer mattered that you needed to be circumcised to be a part of God's family. Uh, About the circumcision? Yeah, that... Yeah, the sacrifices, yep. So prayers, acts of charity, and a heart that truly feared God were now the sacrifices deemed sufficient for him. And even among the men of the circumcision party, we see that 
um, distinctions would not exist among them either. Um, that these are men that fiercely protected the teachings and the acts with Judaism and the laws, such as circumcision. But God was even showing them as well, very gracefully, I think, that none of this was no longer necessary, that specific acts or works didn't make you righteous, um, but a heart that fully fears God. That was what's, what made Cornelius stand out, was his heart fully feared God. The barrier of needing to fulfil certain requirements was being broken down. And what's the end result that we see? God's lavish outpouring of his grace, isn't it? He affirms time and again through the narrative that with him there's no partiality, that anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. It's beautiful, beautiful. And he also shows no favoritism. The same experience that Peter had with his vision was the same one that Cornelius had with his. I loved that. That struck me so much as I read this, that two vastly different men have the very same experience by a very gracious God. I just think that's incredible. And and. You know, that that God chooses to come down and visit Cornelius in the same way that he visited Jesus' mother Mary and Elizabeth and all the other men and women of faith that we read in the Bible. He does that to a Gentile. Like, that is just beautiful to to see that. Um, Yeah, that this vast expression of grace is there and I think the reading from Ephesians 2 that we had before we started is is just to outline that that this that we are brought in um, that people who were separated from Christ having no hope and without God in the world but now in Christ Jesus you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. You're no longer strangers and aliens, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Um, I just think that's a beautiful, vast graciousness of God, of bringing everyone in. Um, It's also in Mark chapter 7, 14 to 23, in Romans 14, 14, Romans 2, 11, Colossians 3, 25, James 2, 1, 1 Peter 1, 17 scripture (laughs) it just covers that that vast graciousness of God that through the death and resurrection of my son I have broken down any barrier of distinction that exists but what else what who who is also the the unseen player in this narrative as well well who's the other main character that we see God the Holy Spirit Oh my gosh, I loved just seeing the work of the Holy Spirit through this passage so much. Um, That both Cornelius and Peter have the same supernatural experience. Um, But what we learned from that encounter was that one was to receive the message, the other was to prepare the message, to give the message uh, there. Preparatory work was done in both men because of it. And soft hearts eager to hear the message received it. I just love that, that preparatory work that happened. That the Holy Spirit also enabled, uh, empowered the ministry and the message. So it enabled Peter to go without hesitation. That's what enabled him to go, to put aside all that he'd learnt throughout his entire life and follow in obedience to the calling of the Holy Spirit, saying, go without hesitation. He was able to boldly and clearly share the message of Christ and tell them that forgiveness of sins was possible through faith in Christ. And as a result, we see that gracious, generous outpouring, that second Pentecost that happened over these Gentiles, um, freely, freely, freely poured out. Um, God's gift of forgiveness of sins and leaving us with the Holy Spirit has no barriers. All can receive him. All are welcome here. There is no distinction here. So what's the link? What's the link? We've got this incredible narrative of two vastly different men being visited by God um, and, and the word goes forth to these Gentiles. The spirit falls upon them and, and the gospel message goes forth. How do, we, how do we make this incredible pivotal narrative in the book of Acts relevant to us? How do we take the principles and link it right down? 
Um, Because, you know, after all, yes, the gospel has been shared to the Gentiles. We're outworking of that. Um, And obviously that there is one mandate from Scripture, uh, you know, that is we are to continue to do that, share the gospel, share the gospel. But what was it that made this interaction so radical? What was it that made the men of the circumcision party go up to Peter and say, what have you done? What were you doing up there or down there or wherever they were? What, what was it that made it so radical? I think that's an element, yeah. What was it that... Um, so radical is repeated in this narrative twice. It's repeated elsewhere in the New Testament. It's radical because it broke down the barriers. It was radical because they shared time together that Peter went to Cornelius' house and was with him. It was radical because they shared meals together. They shared many meals together. It was radical because they spent time in each other's home, a Jew and a Gentile sharing time, much time, in a home together. It was radical. It's radical because hospitality had now become mission. The, t- the cultural practice of having people in your home was now mission. And as I was reading through the book of Acts, preparing for this weekend, I, I was writing down a lot of themes that I saw coming out of the book, and I couldn't ignore the fact that home was the one that came up the most, that many good things was happening in people's homes. Churches were being built. Conver- conversions occurred, like Lydia, we see that. That was in her home. Teaching was given, like Priscilla and Aquila, inviting Apollos into their home. So things are happening in their home. And missionaries, so like Paul, receive respite in homes from the exhausting work. Um, in that home is a really distinct theme within this book that hospitality is a key part of Christian living and gospel work so when you open your home you're opening your heart and when you open your heart you're opening your time hospitality biblical hospitality incorporates so much more than having people over for a meal it's making room making room with your heart making room with your time making room for gospel-centered conversations it's making room to be led by the holy spirit in your interactions with other people it's showing no distinction who you show it to it's allowing the interaction to be empowered by the holy spirit it's being obedient to god's leading even when it seems illogical it's allowing god's grace to freely pour over the interaction When we show biblical hospitality, as exampled through this narrative, we are showing the gospel. That's one way how we can go with this. So how can you show that? How can you show no distinction in who you show it to? Perhaps it's starting to think outside your normal circle of friends. Who is that new woman that's been coming to church that you're yet to get to know? Who is that person who's been coming for a little while but you haven't really spoken to them much? Who's that person that you could be spending time talking to after the service rather than your normal circle of friends or getting to know better instead of your usual group of friends? Or perhaps it may even be an area in your life that you regard perhaps maybe as common or unclean. That might be a barrier for you showing that biblical hospitality to someone Peter had never even entertained the thought to eat those foods considered common or unclean. Is there someone or something you regard as common or unclean that you need to break down a barrier with? Imagine where we would be if Peter had held on to his pride and he didn't break down that barrier. Imagine. But he didn't. And that's the whole point. Peter didn't hold on to his pride. Instead, he accompanied without hesitation. So the second point, that he was obedient to what God was asking him to do, even when this would have felt and seemed completely illogical. Never had he associated with Gentiles in this way before. Yet here he was, listening to the Holy Spirit, staying in their house and sharing many meals together. 
Likewise, how is God calling you to accompany without hesitation? Even when it feels illogical, but trusting in God's leading, you continue to move forward in that situation. Like, for example, inviting those you would not naturally invite to your next girl's night in or something like that. Um, Perhaps it's someone that you might not automatically think of to include uh, when you plan something like this. But following in that leading, trusting God in that prompting may bring more blessing than you know. You just don't know. And as I said before, the aspect I loved so much was just watching this unfolding of the Holy Spirit through this whole narrative there, that the Spirit was preparing Cornelius to have someone come tell him about Jesus, perhaps the answer to the prayers that he was praying for. We don't know what he was praying, but I wonder if that was his prayer. Lord, send me someone to tell me about Jesus. The Spirit was preparing Peter to be that one to fulfill those prayers, the one who would come and share the gospel with him. If the Holy Spirit did that then, what's to stop him from doing that now? I think Robert brought that out beautifully yesterday, that how do you, not, how do you know that your making room for someone is not the answer to their prayer? How do you know that your offer of just a simple cheese toasty for lunch might not be the friendship that that young woman is praying for. I was that young woman praying for that friend when I first moved here and I can honestly say that it was that cheese toasty lunch that kept me in Adelaide. For that cheese toasty opened up a whole new circle of women that I had not even met met yet who would form my new circle of friends and that friend is one of my closest today. Hospitality as mission, empowered by the Holy Spirit, also creates a possibility for gospel-focused conversations. This narrative is the best gospel-focused conversation there is, I think, in Scripture. Um, And I guarantee that if we went around the room, that all of you would have a story um, of where you just made room and that gospel-focused conversation was enabled and allowed to happen. The one moment where you followed the Holy Spirit into that interaction with that person and it led to that conversation. Don't underestimate that possibility now. The Spirit still works in this way. He still does. Make room in your heart to let him use you in this way. Peter's hospitality enabled grace to be extended to people, all people of all nations. When you show hospitality in this way, you're also exampling God's grace to others. You're showing his grace that when your heart is making room for those who who might be just that little bit different from yourself, that, that you are showing God's grace to them, that God's grace is for you as well. And you may have no idea what impact this act of hospitality may have on that person as a result. So I opened our time together by posing that question, have your plans changed And I'm sure every one of you would say, absolutely. And a few years back, my plans were changed. Um, I had hoped for that quiet Sunday afternoon. On this Sunday afternoon, I had opted to go home after church instead of normally going out with my friends um, after this. And I arrived to my house to find one of my friends literally sitting on my doorstep. Uh, We'd only recently started to build a friendship. Uh, We'd shared some common friends and common interests, and we I didn't have, she didn't have my number, but she'd been to my house for a Galentine's party that I'd had um, earlier in the year. Um, yeah, but I just had no idea that she was there. And, and my first thought was, oh my goodness, how am I going to care for my friend this afternoon? Um, I knew that my fridge was almost empty. All I had in it literally was butter, milk, cheese and bread. <laughs> That's all I had um, in there. And, but soon, over a pot of tea... And a cheese toasty, nothing mattered. All she needed was a friend that afternoon who would make room for her that day and listen to her and pray for her as she navigated an ocean of change that she was going through. That afternoon cemented our friendship in a deep way. And since then, we've had heaps more many meaningful, tearful and prayer-filled conversations and I regard her now as one of my dearest friends. Peter had his plans changed. His lunch that afternoon radically changed the world for all time. 
but he listened to the Holy Spirit, who was obedient to his leading, and he made room for the centurion, and Christianity has never been the same since. Biblical hospitality is more than just giving people a meal. It is about making room. It is about making room for you, with your home for others, with your time for others, with your heart for others who might be just that little bit different from yourself. Being willing to be led by the Holy Spirit interact- interactions that seem completely illogical, but trusting the Holy Spirit to have gone before this whole situation. Being willing to let God lead you and use you with a, his enormous gracious plan that he has for mankind. There's no distinction or partiality with the gospel. Hospitality should also be the same. You're sharing the gospel when you show biblical hospitality. That's how you can go. Thank you. Mm. We might just close in prayer and um, get ready for morning tea. Father, we thank you for your gracious plan of mankind that with you there is no distinction, that there is no partiality, that you have opened your arms wide and you have said all may come in. Anyone from any nation can come into my family. Father, I pray that we would be women who would embody that with our lives, that we would be women who would, who would show no distinction in the relationships, the friendships that we have, that we would have hearts that make room, that make room for your spirit to move, that make room to allow gospel conversations to happen. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. Thank you for leaving him with us. Thank you for the power that lies with your Holy Spirit. And I pray that as we leave here today, that we would be women who would be empowered and led by your Holy Spirit. We thank you for your son. We thank you for the barriers that are broken down because of your son. And we pray that as women, our life would just be one to glorify and worship you in that. In these things we pray in your most worthy and precious name. Amen.